Hello, today I'd like to tell, talk to you about the mystery of Edwin Drood. Um, I was going to record this video yesterday afternoon, but I encountered a uh, miserable little girl next door who uh, all her friends were doing something else. She had nobody to play to, no ideas about what she wanted to do, and just a little bit sorry for herself, really. So we went out and played volleyball for an hour or so and had some fun with the rabbit and um, I bought outside my <laughs> new copy of The Mystery of Edwin Dude uh, and yeah I left it out in the rain last night however another reminder of um, the fun we had together and sometimes Dickens can wait for other things really <sighs> indeed um, waiting so the general public had waited four years, five years, um, for Dickens to start serialising his latest novel um, after our mutual friend. Uh, it seems that he had a lot more financial responsibilities um, since he had to uh, look after his wife uh, and his mistress uh, moved into a new place in the country, Gads Hill, uh, and his sons were abroad uh, and they needed financial help. Funnily enough, um, a lot of them went into uh, colonial service, the boys, uh, and this is partly reflected uh, in Dickens' last book. So, 1870, um, he planned to release it in 12 parts. Uh, we only have six parts, so essentially we have half of the novel. Um, from the bibli bibliography point of view, um, there's a good there's a good video about this. Um, it there's a lot of confusion about when the first editions came out. Even though it was an incomplete book, uh, Dickens' completed works was a growing thing while Dickens was alive, um, uh, and it must have come out in the first edition sooner or later. Um, it turns out there were four or five different versions that came out in uh, 1875. So it took five years. Uh, for somebody to edit it and bind it and, and present it to the public. Um, it is a book that's kind of a little bit lost, really, in the Dickens oeuvre. Um, uh, and that's a shame, because it's it's an incomplete masterpiece, really. And uh, yet again, we see Dickens moving in new directions as a novelist. It's um, it's a fascinating read. Um, you get to the end and you're you're completely hooked in this book, you want to know what happens. Uh, it's very exciting. So, let's have a jump in. So here's my copy. <laughs> and as you can see, I bought this from the Kemp for a pound or so, and uh, yeah, the spine came off quite quickly. Interestingly enough, it just says, whoops, uh, Edwin Drood. A lot of the early editions uh, only had Edwin Drood on the cover, maybe because the size of the... Um, title. Um, this clearly isn't a first edition. <laughs> they would have normally they have a, like a band here with um, Charles Dickens' signature, uh, gold embossed. Very lovely. Uh, if you do have a first edition, then it's probably worth a lot of money. So um, yes, so Dickens had uh, set, had quite a few health setbacks. Uh, he had what probably nowadays we consider a stroke uh, and uh, he's he was burning all his energy doing readings to generate money um, for all his expenses uh, and he could feel that um, his life was waning away from him um, and he was you know worried about how this novel was going to go um, <clears throat> So, <laughs> what to say about it? Uh, so it's set in Cloisterham, um, uh, which is uh, probably the place where Dickens was settled at that time, uh, near uh, Rochester, basically. It's a small town, a uh, cathedral town, and um, yes, the naming is very symbolic. It's Cloisterham. Um, people do seem cloistered in this environment. It's, it's quite a restrictive place. Um, and the the description, as far less description in, than in other 
Dickens's books. Um, uh, a lot of it's symbolic uh, when he's describing the town. It's you know it seems impressive on the outside with this big cathedral and all these uh, cathedral outhouses and the crypt and everything. But at the same time, it's crumbling down. It's mouldy. It's uh, it's in decline. Uh, the town is purposefully decided it wasn't going to have a railway link so it's like it's living in the past uh, and of course you know underneath this edifice of religion we have all these bodies in the wall and Durdles goes around with his hammer knocking on the walls and saying oh yep there's another one and uh, yep there's another one um, it's it's built on on the back of lots of death. Yes, of course, and obviously colonial riches were paid for by the death of um, slaves to from Africa to the New World. So, you know, and then, of course, we do have um, the colonial couple, the landlesses coming into the story. It's very clear um, how the symbolism is working in this book. And there's also a sort of slight, kind of slight hint of the Gothic about it. Lots of nighttime scenes in, um, you know, down the crypt. Uh, it's a little bit spooky, and of course the the main character, which isn't really Edwin Drood, it's the John Jasper, which is the lay precentor. Basically, he's the choir master. Uh, he is very much a sort of a gothic evil character, uh, a little bit like Dracula. He's very kind of respectable during the day. He belongs to the upper classes, but uh, by night he's he's a monster, it seems. Or is he? We don't know. We don't know. That's part of the, the mystery of Edwin Drood. Um, you know, Dickens didn't get to reveal his full thoughts. Um, however, it's not that much of a mystery, really, because he did, Dickens did reveal to his uh, close friend John Foster and biographer um, that the story was about uh, an uncle who murders his nephew um, and indeed the the book is just full of clues uh, and so it shouldn't really come as too much of a surprise um, if I say that I think John Jasper is the murderer um, and yes I'll go through read a few passages um, talk about the characters um, uh, and hopefully this will become a bit clearer to you. I'll have to ditch the spine. So, we have the first description of John Jasper, who's the uncle of the uh, the eponymous character of the book, uh, Edrin Drood, who's a young man who's studying engineering uh, and is engaged to Rosa Bud. Uh, and is planning on getting married and shooting over to Africa to 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 do all kinds of useful things, he thinks. Um, and early on, we have a description of Mr. Jasper. is a dark man of some six and twenty with thick, lustrous, well-arranged black hair and whiskers. He looks older than he is, as dark men often do. His voice is deep and good. His face and figure are good. His manner is a little sombre. His room is a little sombre and may have had its influence in forming his manner. It is mostly in shadow. So we've got a clear tension here between Jasper being, you know, a handsome young man with a good figure and a good voice. But then second part of the description uh, is his manner is a bit sombre and his room is a bit sombre and he seems in shadow. All right, that's clear, a little bit of... Um, that's probably the first clue from Dickens of who the murderer is. Um, uh, so, there you go, right from the beginning. Uh, then we've got, what we've got. I should get on to the philanthropist later. Uh, oh, oh, the lamp. So... Yes. Oh, let's talk a little bit about uh, opium. <laughs> what a good topic. What a good topic. So we start, we see at the very beginning, first chapter of this book, we've got uh, Mr. Jasper, who's uh, on a bed in London, passed out with a Chinaman and Alaska. 
Um, not sure where the Lascars came from, but obviously colonials um, uh, and the obviously the opium mix, the opium lady in the opium den. Uh, and he wakes up somewhat disgusted with himself. Um, while the other two are passed out, the opium dealer is offering to give him um, another hit. Uh, and he leaves his money on the table and he, he runs out to catch the train back to Cloisterham uh, just in time. And he puts on his, uh, his, his gown and he goes singing. But of course, there's the mention of the gowns that they're, they're not spotless. Yes, just like he's not spotless, really. There's quite heavy symbolism in this. Um, and then, you know, you've got shortly afterwards, he hosts a dinner party for his nephew um, uh, and... He's smoking a pipe a game at the end of that evening as well. So he's clearly an adult, he's clearly an ad, some sort of addict to opium, and he does confess it to his nephew, saying he's had a few pains and the rest of it. Uh, but yes, it's a little bit sinister. I think nobody realises the extent of his addictions. And the people obviously don't realise the extent of his obsessions. Addiction and obsession seem to go hand in hand for uh, John Jasper. Uh, and it becomes increasingly clear that he is a very evil and dangerous character. So, what is... Um, so, well, other clues? Um, there's lots of them. So, from the top of my memory, there's the, uh, what, see, the key scene in the crypt uh, where he has a passing interest about being shown a crypt by Durdles, who's this sort of the caretaker and the masonry expert. Um, and he brings a bottle with him because he knows Durdles is a big drinker. Um, uh, and he offers the bottle to him and Durdles takes liberal amounts of it uh, and then says, I just need to lie down for, I need to have 40 winks. Uh, and Durdles passes out. Uh, and when he comes to... Uh, it's been hours later, uh, and then Deputy, which is a little boy, I don't know if he's homeless or not, but he hangs around uh, the crypt uh, and sort of pesters, dirdles, uh, uh, and Jasper gets really angry with the boy being there uh, and turns quite violent in it because it's slightly clear he, you know, he's worried that somebody will see something. Um, uh, and then there's... Then there's another part where he's with Edwin Drood. Uh, I th think it's the night of the murder. We're not sure when exactly the murder happens. The, the watch would have um, maybe indicated this, but we don't. We didn't get the time. Uh, and he's. They see uh, Neville and Chris Sparkle, and he says, "Hold back. We don't. You know, let's let's not get involved." It's like he's he's got this sort of secretive tendency um, about him. Uh, one story. Yes, so yes, sir, that's actually the clue that. Um, oh, yes, so. And then the day after, um, it's revealed that Edwin Drood has disappeared. Um, it, Jasper is um, singing better than he ever did before. Uh, it's clear that maybe he thinks. He got away with it, and he's very sneaky with showing his diary entries all the time to uh, Chris Sparkle to create this narrative that it must have been this violent foreigner, uh, Neville Landless, um, that is behind the disappearance of his nephew and his one of his avowals for revenge and finding out the truth. Um, he's using it as evidence as such. Um, he's very clever to you know, hide his tracks. And then at the end, right near the end, he goes to back to the opium den uh, in London um, and he has five pipes. Um, I must admit that um, maybe the size of their pipes is a lot bigger than uh, the pipes they give you in Laos nowadays. And he seems to be zonked after the first one. But he comes around uh, and he's clearly out of it. Um, and he says, well, I have told you I did it here hundreds of thousands of times. What do I say? 
I did it millions and billions of times. I did it so often and through such vast expanses of time that when it was really done, it seemed not worth the doing. It was done so soon. All right. So we've got John Jasper essentially confessing to uh, the opium lady that, um, you know, he's been thinking of murdering his nephew for a long time and that when he did do it, it was all over too quickly. And because he's done it in his mind over and over again, there's a sort of air of unreality to the actual action. So he's clearly unmoored and somewhere in his consciousness, he's it's bubbling up. He needs to confess it. There's, there's this thing in um, a lot of murder literature that there's the need for the murderer to actually tell somebody um, about what they've done or to revisit the scene of the scene of the crime and the rest of it you know on the surface they think they've got away with it but deep down there's some sort of psychological um, reaction going on uh, where they they need to expose themselves and I'm sure there's must be a body of um, forensic evidence that police use to indicate this. Ah, uh, one thing I do remember seeing on TV that uh, when they hold you in the interrogation room and they're looking through the one-way, two-way mirror at you, uh, those that fall asleep in the interrogation room or left alone are generally guilty and those that stay awake and pace the room and are worried are generally those that um, aren't guilty. So there's obvious tells and it would seem that Dickens is getting very... Um, wise to all of this really um <laughs> so let's go back to the beginning a little bit <clears throat> edwin drood edwin drood as commentators have uh, pointed out he's not a very likable man from a distance uh he is he's handsome he's young uh, he belongs to the upper classes he's had a good education um or his life seems to lie in front of him and seems to be a, a very good life, um, the prospect of a very good life. He's uh, adored by the, the young pupils who were um, being educated at Nunn's house uh, and his fiance uh, is one is the teacher there. But, he's, yes, he doesn't come across as very sympathetic. He's, he's kind of arrogant and dismissive. Uh, he fails to see that obviously the, the the problems underneath bubbling away with his uncle and yeah he's not he lacks the empathy and the sympathy that you have with uh, the best of the Charles Dickens positive characters and we're not really meant to see him that way it's like their engagement is just painful to watch he gets to invite her out for a little walk when she can leave the cloistered environment of the nun's house and they have to walk around town very primly and properly he buys her some sweets and he doesn't like sweets um and then she gets like you know a face full of sugar and so she can't kiss him and sort of blows him kisses um and she's um for her part of course what do you expect you know she's just lived all of her life as this in this retreat in the school um her parents died when she was young she was taken up uh, by the school she's got a guardian who's the solicitor grugius uh, in london she's seen nothing of the world and so she's saying to him you know you're gonna go to egypt um you know what's all that about she just she can't grasp it and these two it's so frustrating he says you know he calls her pussy so she's he's he's yeah you know, he's infantilizing her um and he doesn't seem to understand anything about what's going on with her and she doesn't really do, seem to understand anything about what's going on with him and a little bit like our, our mutual friend their marriage is kind of being agreed by their fathers before them and they're just kind of going along with this without fully um you know knowing each other the rest of it they're just going to get married and it's a situation of men and women really didn't have much experience of each other. And he says, you know, pussy uh, is a certain flatness attending on our lovemaking because you, you've you got no flirting abilities, mate. You don't know how to talk to a woman. You don't know, uh, you know, how to ask her questions about uh, what she likes, what she hopes. 
um, you know, uh, complimenting her and the rest of it. It is really painful watching uh, their their courting scenes. Um, and rather, he's just depressed about it rather than, you know, trying to do something about it. And it's clear that uh, when they do decide to split up um, and he's saying goodbye to her at the steps of the school, um, that there's clear sexual desire there. She looks longingly at him and there's a moment where, you know, he's thinking, oh, I should do something, I should do something. But he's he's restricted by this Victorian morality where, you know, only a little kiss, hidden kiss is all you could get, really. And um, men and women just had no knowledge of each other. Not just carnal knowledge, but... Um, sort of working knowledge that comes with growing up with the opposite sex um and i don't think this is satire on dickens's part it's just like it's quite frustrating that we have this character who's going to die um and yes he just seems to be a little bit pathetic it could be partly based upon um some commentators have pointed out um some of dickens's sons who did seem a bit of a failure to dickens and he he did say you know uh, my father was bad for me and now I can see that um, I'm bad for my children or vice versa. Um, they, so they can't live up to the man because very few people can live up to the achievements of Charles Dickens. But, you know, they want to be doers rather than writers. And, and Dickens seems to be um, all for that in, from what we, gather, we can gather from reading his books. But they don't seem to impress him very much. And Edwin Drew doesn't really uh, impress the reader very much. He's just kind of like... He's very passive in this series of events. He doesn't seem to get anything. There's a point where, because um, Rose has been taught music by uh, our anti-hero John Jasper, uh, and she's saying um, she just feels uncomfortable with him. He just leers at her, uh, and he's playing some sort of game with her, uh, and she's trying to say this to her fiance, and he just he just dismisses it. He can't. You know, he's not really listening to her. Um, yeah, it's like one of these things where, you know, you can see what's coming, but, uh, well, the reader can, but the characters in the book just, just blinded by their own, I don't know, cloistered world that they live in. Um, yeah, and what's it going to do in Egypt exactly? It's never really <laughs> explained properly. Um, and then we have this very interesting couple that come into it um, uh, with the only bit of really concerted satire that uh, Dickens uh, writes about um, in authorial comment. Uh, and that's the, the Landlesses. you got Neville Landless and uh, Helena Landless. And these are groundbreaking characters for Dickens. He doesn't state it explicitly, but it's pretty clear that they are brown. They're probably South Asian, maybe even half Anglo, half Asian. There was a lot of these people that were left in the empire, especially in India and other places. These these two are from Sri Lanka, um, and so this is kind of, this is brilliant. This is big stuff for Dickens because uh, he has a go at showing how colonialism. Uh, works in, in the mid Victorian period, uh, and it's not a very pleasant picture that he paints. But anyway, we've got first of all, they this couple appear, uh, and they're under the guardianship of uh, Honey Thunder, Honey Thunder, who's a philanthropist, a, a shouty, loud, self righteous philanthropist, and um, yeah. Dickens just takes this bloke apart. He doesn't... Honey Thunder walked in the middle of the road. There you go, just, just didn't give a toss for anybody else. Shouldering the natives out of his way and loudly developing a scheme he had for making a raid on all the unemployed persons in the United Kingdom, laying them, everyone, by the heels in jail and forcing them on pain of prompt extermination to become philanthropists. <laughs> so it's going to round up all the unemployed people and put them in prison, uh, but at the same time make them philanthropists. Yeah, I suppose you could do philanthropy in prison with your uh, prison mates, but it's much more useful to be actually free 
uh, and at large to really <laughs> have an impact as a philanthropist. And so he goes on. His philosophy was that gunpowder sought that the difference between it and animosity was hard to determine. You were to abolish military force, but you were first to bring all commanding officers who had done their duty to trial by court-martial for that offence and shoot them. You were to abolish war, but were to make converts by making war upon them and charging them with loving war as the apple of their eye. You were to have no capital punishment, but were first to sweep off the face of the earth all legislators, jurists and judges who were of the contrary opinion. You were to have universal concord and were to get it by eliminating all the people who wouldn't or conscientiously couldn't be concordant. So he's showing the uh, Ill illogical position of philanthropists uh, and their boorish behaviour um, when they're trying to bring, you know, love and relief to the world. Uh, really, it's about their own vanity and, and they're just loud, thunderous, obnoxious people who apparently have all the answers and all the answers seem to be tear it down, put them in prison, uh, you know, punish those that don't go along with us. Um, and so, ah, yes, I don't know if you can see it, but... Yep, Dickens talked quite a lot to his illustrator. It wasn't Viz, it was, I think, it started off being a, a relative, but somebody else had to take it over. Um, and so one of the pieces of evidence of their Asian background is the cross-hatching on the face of Neville Landless. Um, yeah, he's very much darker than the rest of them. Um, and then we've got his sister, Helena. You can't tell so much. Um, there are phrases which suggest uh, the colour of their skin. Uh, and as far as I know, he, uh, in Martin Chuzzlewit, uh, the butler meets a black person, but he, that black person doesn't really say anything. This could be one of the first you know, Asian black character, the only black and Asian character in Dickens. He got around to it uh, just before he died. <laughs> All right, so... And they're kind of like, they're at the mercy of this philanthropist who puts them um, in Cloisterham um, under the protection uh, of a very nice man, Chris Sparkle. Uh, he's Christian Sparkle. He's the one of the shining good characters in the book uh, and clearly an example of how Christianity should be and how a man of uh, the Lord should be. Funny enough, he's a pugilist, but he's full of compassion uh, he wants to think kindly of people and he's a very much a peacemaker in the argument between uh, Neville and Edwin Drood. Uh, and he's he's always preaching caution and tolerance and kindness. Um, and he's just a wonderful character, wonderful character. Um, so, yes, racism. Yes, this insulting allusion to his dark skin infuriates Neville to that violent degree that he flings the dregs of his wine at Edwin Drood. All right. Um, this is, yeah, yeah, this is because uh, he's really piqued by Edwin Drew saying, you know, basically, you, know, you, you need to get out of white man business. And um, this allusion to uh, the colour of skin is infuriating to Neville and he loses his rag uh, and he throws his wine glass on the floor rather than at Edwin Drew. So he shows, you know, he's kind of pushed into it. He's goaded by the, this, this white upper class society that these two have found themselves in. They're the landlesses, right? They're without land. They're, they're dispossessed and they're, they're basically at the mercy uh, of charity, these two. Um, they're, they're beautiful. They're twins. Um... Uh, Helena becomes a friend with Rosa uh, and Neville, well, he's suspected of killing Edwin Drood uh, and he doesn't help himself by going off on a long walking tour looking like he's trying to uh, evade the arms of justice and then he fights when he's uh, caught and this seems to suggest his guilt. There's blood splattered over him and his too big a walking stick. <laughs> so, you know, he's he's 
because he says he does, doesn't come. I don't come from a walking country, so he doesn't know about walking walk, through the the trodden, the you know the wet ferns of uh, the English countryside. He's not prepared for it. Um, uh, yeah, and he, he clubs some of the people who try to uh, arrest him. Um, and so, ah, yes. So let's have a look about another one. Seeing what I have seen tonight and hearing what I have heard, adds Jasper with great earnestness, I shall never know peace of mind when there is danger of those two coming together, with no one else to interfere. That would be Neville and Edwin Drood. It was horrible. There was something of the tiger in his dark blood. Wow. Yes, you know, you this, so this is colonialism, racism 101, isn't it? So this man who comes from uh, from a foreign country has dark blood uh, and he's a savage. He behaves like an, an animal, you know, compared to how polite and refined the British are, where they actually kill each other's relatives. Um, yeah, and that's kind of a trope that you see through uh, yeah, a lot of um, early industrial racism that goes with the colonies how we were clearly superior to the locals and and they had hot blood uh, and behaved like animals and they needed the civilizing uh, instincts of the british to help them out so uh, oh yes another bit of Uh, Mr. Sapsey, I think he's the mayor of Cloisterham. Uh, Mr. Sapsey is by no means friendly towards the inflammable young spark. He says that his complexion is un-English. And when Mr. Sapsey has once declared anything to be un-English, he considers that thing everlastingly sunk in the bottomless pit. <sighs> That's quite condemning, isn't it? Un-English, uh, and by that he means uh, not white. Uh, yeah, so this is another uh, trope of racism. Um, I saw it very evidently in Japan, where um, anybody who comes from mixed parentage uh, are called uh, halfus. They're only half Japanese, and you could talk to a Japanese person until you're blue in the face and for them unless you look Japanese you're not Japanese if you it doesn't matter if you matter if you're born there or one of your parents are Japanese it's just to do with the color of your skin and your yeah, yeah your yes pigmentation really is you know a, a cultural construct uh, and it's infuriating for those people living in Japan that don't look Japanese enough uh, and obviously Neville doesn't look English enough, you made to feel inferior. In Japan, these people are made to feel half humans, and um, Neville is, becomes the outsider. He's he's un English. You know, it's like an outcast, basically. Um, so you have complete rejection for poor old Neville, who's a, a lovely boy who really wants to uh, impress and succeed. Um, um, and he, he, when he's accuses something but he's released because chris sparkle uh, vouches for him um he knuckles down he just goes to study the law he he wants to he wants to make a success of his life um and he's acutely aware of the color of his skin and he says to uh gregorius i think or chris sparkle i don't like going out during the day it's just too painful for me i only go out at night time Yes, only go out at night time when, when you know, presumably his dark face is hidden by uh, the shadows. Uh, yes, and we have another Mr. Sapsey expresses his opinion that the case had a dark look. In short, and here his eyes rested full on Neville's countenance, an un-English complexion. It's, it's painful, isn't it? It's painful. So we've got this young man who wants to go off to the colonies to prove himself and we've got these people coming from the colonies who um uh, if, yes we just regarded as second class citizens as unable to be english and of course when there is a disappearance and funny business going on then clearly it's the tigerish dark blood of the foreigner who must be responsible 
for the crime. It just is, it's pretty awful uh, and it's pretty damning by Dickens, to be honest, and um, perspicacious and looking to the future as Dickens always seemed to be that, yes, he foresaw the problems of colonialism, of course, when the colonials want to come to the mother country and uh, now we're in this post-colonial age where people find it quite hard to give up their sense of superiority even though we're now the whole world is meant to be equal um we're still banging on about bloody englishness and um certain lives matter and certain other lives don't matter and taking the knee and uh yeah in a way we're still trying to move on from this um but with not so much success ah so ah yes Let's have a look at John Jasper. Fascinating character um, and quite unique for Dickens. Uh, he's an anti-hero. He appears to be good and respectable on the outside, but actually he's thoroughly evil. We don't know exactly because Dickens didn't finish the book, but as I said, there's just, just multiple clues. There's the clues about the watch, uh, the lime, the crypt, um, it goes on and on, and you know the, the, the confession to the opium seller is pretty much certain that he killed his nephew because he has an obsession uh, with his nephew's uh, fiance who he wants to steal uh, and hasn't, and he admits in the sundial scene uh, quite scarily that um, you know I love you, I love you, uh, and I will love you to death. You know, this is his final words and is quite ominous and quite scary. Um, but for the people around him, they don't they don't see any of this. Well, they, Gregorius starts to see it at the end. And Helena, obviously, when she runs, not Helena, uh, when Rosa runs away from London after the Sundial event, there's, she can see that she's been pursued by a monster um, and it'll about little Nell escaping from Daniel Quilp. Um, and then it becomes apparent that he is the bad guy and all the good guy, all the, the good characters are going to be ranged against him. But I don't think there's a character like this in, in Dickens, in a way, because, you know, from the opening, we're made aware of the, yeah, the nasty, the villains. Um, there's no hiding them. Dickens doesn't do what he's done here, which is to show a man that has a lot of potential. He's, he's a brilliant musician. He's got a good place in society, uh, he's loved by his nephew, um, he's, he works for a church, he should be Christian, but uh, yeah, he's just this massive anti-hero character. So to compare him to other characters, you've got obviously Daniel Quilp, I just mentioned uh, from the old Curiosity Shop, he, he was just straight up an evil little dwarf, there's no hiding that fact and and dickens you know he does kind of maybe explain that he's got a hunchback and that he's been pushed out of normal society and so this is how he's got to that stage then you've got obviously opportunists like silas wegg uh the, yes, who gets involved with the boffins uh and he's just on the make just and he's very much there for comic relief you've got um chuzzlewit who thinks he murders his uh uncle or father but doesn't actually uh, and he's an evil scheming character and he shows himself to be a right sadist when he marries cherry just to basically get his revenge on the girl um uh, and to make her life thoroughly miserable you've got fagan who's a manipulator uh and a miser uh and a, a groomer of children he's uh, yeah somewhat of a stereotype um he has a certain humanity to him as i talked about earlier uh, and then bill sykes is just a basic thug see none of the blandoir in little dorrit uh you've got the the, the lawyer's talking horn who's yes whose motives are very deep and he doesn't seem to have uh, any empathy for humanity and the rest of it uh, you've got but they're they're not this complex anti-hero that we have in the final book by Dickens. And it's really, he's a very impressive character, has to be said. Um, and I'm sure in a play or on a screen, he would come over uh, yeah, absolutely brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly. Um, and that, that's where I think the book was going. Because it's, it's, 
strikes me that it's um, very much a noir tone to the book, like uh, the, the previous book, Our Mutual Friend. It, it's in the dark, you know, it's dealing with some of the repressed desires. Um, it's, it's looking at the dark side of human nature and the clues come more and more often. So what do I think uh, about who killed Edwin Drood? Is John Jasper. How did he do it? He probably poisoned him because there's a mention about him taking a long time mixing the drinks and he's already managed to uh, drug Durdles and he himself is quite uh, experienced with drugs, it seems, and able to get hold of them pretty easily. So, yes, he drugs his nephew, um, kills him, puts him in the, the crypt in Lyme, thinking everything will dissolve. He doesn't know that the poor boy has the ring that's been released by Rose's guardian, Gregus, the attorney, an angular man. Um, so that's going to be how he's going to be caught. Uh, uh, and then you, he's, he's emboldened by the death of his nephew uh, to declare his love for Rosa. She flees. He follows her at the same time. The opium dealer begins to realise that this posh character who's turning up at the the opium den has got a dark secret and she starts to follow him around and you know it's what i envision here uh is that you get with dickens was about on the point of revealing to us that john jasper is the murderer a little bit like in the middle of um our mutual friend john Harmon is exposed as being alive and pretending to be Julius Rocksmith. It was getting more and more obvious. Uh, and then the twist is in the middle of the book, right, in our, our mutual friend. And then there's a final twist at the end where the boffins turn out to be not misers and strange people, but actually very positive people. So this is what I think Dickens was on the verge of doing. He's about to reveal that yet John Jasper is actually a monster and he's probably looking to um, abduct Rosa, uh, maybe kill Neville. You know, he's got he's got he's got murder in his blood. It seems his blood's up, and he, he wants more. Uh, and so, I think Dickens was going for somewhat like a yeah cinematic kind of moment where it becomes very fast paced and action. Uh, and suspenseful at the end, where the they're going to have to try and track down uh, John Jasper uh, and prevent him from committing more terrible crimes. And then you see you've got gathered these good characters uh, in London, Grugus, Gru, Grugius, a weird name. Uh, this new character called Tartar is very inventive uh, as a sailor, but he's got enough money to retire. Uh, he's got this bizarre room full of plants. Um, uh, Bazard, who seems to disappear, more in a moment from that. Uh, Helene is there. You see, and we always have a block of good characters in a Dickens novel, and you see, they're gathering their forces to uh, pr protect Rosa uh, and presumably bring this man to justice. And at the same time, we've got this strange character who just suddenly turns up in Cloistrum who demands to to rent a place near the cathedral with some peculiar architecture. But it's clear that he's actually just watching the uh, cathedral uh, and John Jasper and is making marks in a cupboard, uh, different length lines, which signify something to uh, the character, but not to the reader as such. I think that might be Bazard, the mysterious um, assistant to Grugius, who wrote a play, but is frustrated and not being able to get it published. Um, so, yeah, these new characters are clearly intended to, is like, a, is an advent, it is the start of the second part of the novel, which is going to be, I suspect, full of action, chases, um, exciting stuff, basically. Um, yeah, and Dickens, uh, yeah, he wants to entertain and he, he, you know, he wants to be remembered as a great entertainer uh, as well as a teacher. Um, and yes, he's not disappointing. This would have been one hell of a novel if he'd finished it. Um, I'm sure <laughs> at the time there was a sort of mock trial with uh, J.K. Chesterton, um, um, Bernard Shaw, other notable 
writers uh, and critics of the time and it's all a bit jokey but even there you're thinking generally yes it's John Jasper that did it but that's I don't think it's a really a who did it novel because yes Edwin Drood was killed by his uncle his body is probably in the crypt the reason the motive is his obsessive desire for his nephew's fiance rosa so you know all the basic things already out there it wasn't going to be a big reveal at the end of this book uh dickens already put it in the book and as i said he told john foster that it was about a story about an uncle that kills his nephew so that's where i think dickens was going with this um uh, yep yeah, and the, the book is a lot smaller you know so so it would have turned out quite thick but it just reads really really quickly and yes he's cut down on the description a lot and the the description does seem to be very symbolic and it's building up this image uh of this repressive little town uh in the countryside in england which is holding a dark secret it's a little bit reminds me a little bit of Peyton place you know on the surface it's all very respectable and middle class but underneath it's it's seething with passion unfulfilled passions uh death uh, addiction uh there's even bodies you know uh, in buried in there it's like the skeletons in the closet and obviously this 1950s pulp fiction thing reveals the, the sordid secrets behind the respectability um this is what dickens is doing and he's really re-emphasizing that or emphasizing that with his descriptions of uh, cloistrum and the architecture um the gargoyles in the church uh the details are pretty clever but yeah it's it's clear that dickens is He's honing his art. He wasn't, didn't go to write something like Our Mutual Friend Again. I don't think he, he realised that he didn't have the strengths for that. Um, and as I said, the only bit where he really breaks free uh, of narration is when he's condemning the philanthropists for being you know, hypocrites and being more trouble uh, than they're worth. Otherwise, he really much sticks to the storyline um, and... It's interesting that his canvas is a lot smaller. He doesn't feel the need for introducing loads of upper-class characters like, you know, the Veneerings and Mr. Myrtle, the banker, uh, and using them as vehicles to uh, condemn the upper classes for being useless and vain and superficial and having bad taste, but actually uh, hating each other and, um, you know, hoping to bankrupt each other and the rest of it. He, he skips all of that. That's That's taken out the novel and it's fo it's a much smaller cast of people and it's a fascinating cast of people as i said that uh, the yes the smell of the colonies is very clear in this novel um and he's very clear um that this brings with it terrible forms of racism uh, and a mangled form of englishness which i'm sure dickens wouldn't um accept at all um and with it with it murder and addiction um, and it's more than likely because Dickens had like a stroke as one of the reasons why he wasn't writing very much uh, that he was taking opium and this is another product of the colonies because it all comes in all the good stuff comes into the to the mother country and we send them out our whatever we want to sell them um, in return uh, yeah, I suspect that yeah, Dick, he, he's quite realistic as I said the very big pipe sizes in those days <laughs> but yes it's it's very much a novel of its time isn't it and yet the yet things are coming modernity is on the way uh, and it's like he almost anticipated you know this whole cinematic genre of you know, the noir the murder stories um, the violence the rest of it uh, and he could see that that's what the public like to read um and yes he's very good at being in tune with his public and of course um at his funeral uh, at poet's corner there was you know uh, public mourning grieving um non-stop they, they opened the, the church for two days and they'd had to turn people away there was a vast amount of um you know flowers that were gathered from the countryside um obviously poor people just leaving whatever they could is tribute to the man um yeah 
<sighs> but what did I take from all of this? Well, I took from this, of course, that um, sometimes it's better to play with your daughter than talking rubbish about Charles Dickens. Uh, and that's it for today. Thank you very much. <laughs>